25 and I call them into order. To introduce those with us this evening, we have Planning Board Member Stephen Hadfield to my left, Planning Board Member Rob Tersler to my left, Peter Coffin, also a Planning Board Member, I'm Lynn Merrill, I'm the Chair of the Board, Robert Potter is our Administrative Assistant, Chris Bashaw is a Planning Board Member and South Selectman's Representative, Peter Bakey is a Planning Board Member, and Rob Gay is the Vice Chair. Glenn Greenwood is our planner, top planner, and he is joining us as well to give us his valuable results. So the following committee to order, I got an email uh, today from Phil Coombs, who wanted to speak with us about impact bees and trash and recycling receptacles. And he asked that, you know, for the right time, and knowing that our next few meetings may be packed, I suggested to come tonight. He is here. Phil, come join us. Phil is our Public Works Director. Good evening. Um, so I kind of wanted to get the conversation started. Um, as you may be aware, we went to automated pickup, which entails having a trash can for each residence and in addition to a recycling bin. Um, the town has assessed a fee for an additional can at $687. This includes uh, five years of pickup and the $70 cost of the uh, receptacle itself that we pay to waste management. Um, I guess my proposal here tonight is to have an additional impact fee for accessory dwelling units for new homes in town that would cover the cost of the receptacle for trash and recycling and not necessarily saying $687 or $757, but um, some kind of fee to offset this. Uh, right now, you have school, library, and fire, and I can guarantee you that they will use trash every week. They may not go get a library book or take a ride in the ambulance or send a kid to a school. They will definitely be imposing a burden on the town that is unanticipated, which to my knowledge is what the impact fees are meant to negate. So uh, that's my proposal. But if they're leaning on the receptacle? Well, they're taking it. If they're building a house, we have to give them a so I'm just basing the number on what we're charging for someone getting an additional receptacle, but this would be their... their so if they're getting ADU? Yeah. Well, they're getting an additional receptacle, don't you just charge them for it? If they have an ADU, if it's a legal permitted ADU, we do not charge them for it. Oh, you don't? No. For the first one? For the first one. First one. So these are just additional ones? Well, yeah. that doesn't mean time a new home is built. We would assess an impact fee for the solid for the solid waste disposal. So if someone, if someone comes in and wants to put an ADU in, this would be one of the impact fees that they would have to pay. So it would be part of an ADU coming into the house? Correct. So in other words, if somebody goes with an ADU, you're automatically going to charge them an impact fee if this goes through, even if they don't want the receptacles? So the receptacles stay with the house. So if they don't want it, five years from now, they can say, they could sell it and someone could say, well, I've got an ADU here, I'm not a receptacle, and we would have to provide them with one. So this would at least defray the cost. If they don't take it on the first time, they would still be allowed to have one moving forward. But this is also if somebody builds a cul-de-sac and puts 10 houses on it, right. or a developer, they're going to have to pay 10 impact fees to get the solid waste recycling for that. Right. I've got a quick question. Are impact fees chargeable only for capital expenses? Yes. And so the $70 would be okay, but the, the five years of picking up charges is not a capital expense. Correct. But it is an unanticipated. Not it's not a capital Yes. It's, it's, it's like not a capital expense. In fact, it's for anticipated. Um, because we anticipated that for every house there'll be certain you know, 1.6 trillion that will go to schools and there'll be you know, this much police protection or this much you know, fire protection, whatever the impact fees cover. Uh, and right now the impact fees are collected and let's say the 
driving impact is. If, if somebody charges an impact down, you know, it's put on the lot for the lot. If it's closing, then it's going to be five years, whatever it is, how do we want to do that? That expires and it goes back to the purchaser or the builder or whatever who paid the impact fee. So, um, in this case, a receptacle, the 70 bucks for the receptacle. Will be 140 with the recycling and the trash. Right, right, right. 140 would be the capital expense. And it's guaranteed to be used because you're going to provide a trash receptacle for every, uh, and recycling for every new property that goes in. So, that's not a question of whether it's used or not. Um, and it's obviously not a question of whether the pickups can be used or not, because, but that's not a capital expense. So I think legally we would be restricted to charging just the capital expense of the bins. And so we have to be at an additional charge, which I do think that's what we have on right now. I, I wish there was a way to say, you know, a capital account to pay for recycling and, and uh, trash pickups, but it's not first and that's that's the annual tax bill. Yep. yep. No, it's a great point. I just, again, yeah. thought I'd throw it out there and have a conversation. Yeah. 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 We're, we're not a good place with solid waste recycling budgeting. And I, I'm not as quick to discourage that we can't. We can't do it if we can show that the contract, the overall contract price for solid waste for the town increased for some reason, if it increased because waste management was doing an expansion. Uh, but that would be a study. That would, we would have to be able to verify those things beyond the actual physical barrel. And that would be a massive amount of expense. Because <laughs> it's always been building a facility. Uh, and they trust me, we can do that. They are always doing it because of increased demand. Right. So all we would have to show is that there was increased demand and that they were subsequently increasing the charge to the town. So there, there could be a way to do it, uh, but it would we'll take, we'll take study in order to be able to prove that we were legitimately uh, basing it upon an overall expanded need to generally do growth. Um, but still, you're not to the solid waste uh, provider. So, but it's actually right. In, initially, the seven times two could be tacked on, I believe. Yeah, there is a fee schedule that's broken down in the contract. So basically, they figure every additional stop, they need to charge us for that additional stop. So, and they have it, I think it's $127 per stop. Or, Per additional total that we add on the contract. Um, as far as long term capital improvements, you know, we are looking at moving a collection point for recycling in the town, but I don't think we're anywhere near where we could assess fees on that. So. Well, that would be a case where if you put something in for the uh, capital improvement or you know, recycling facility or whatever, and then we didn't build it. We didn't use that time that something was whatever we, that we had to use that. That portion, you know, the 140 was still in the town, but the, um, that portion that was for a recycling facility, we didn't spend it, that would have to go back to each 80 or whatever, you know. And if they've already spent 140 per household, I mean, they just spent $70 for every household in town, why would we penalize people just moving in? But moved in next week because they were part of the year month ago. Or two weeks ago. Doesn't make sense to me. So the, the, the use thing and the use part of the current contract needs to be assessed per per house. And if that means that more houses mean higher taxes, you know. Well, the town, the town chose to charge the builder $140 per house, you know, as part of the fee to have trash pick up. I mean, that's something we can do anyway without us, without impact fee. So How would you do that? Well, if somebody, if somebody builds a house and they want to have trash pick up, then we have to pay $140 for the receptacles. If I, in Florida, if I want a new receptacle, because we have the same thing down there, and I, if I 
build a new house and I want a receptacle, I have to go and pay the city $40 for that receptacle. They actually come in three different sizes for this little one. So the way it's kind of set up is we, and again, trying to just start the conversation, wasn't planning on speaking on this four hours later, but, <laughs> uh, you know, we have given a, a, a trash recycling bin to every residence in town. And as we've kind of fumbled our way through this process, I've gone to the board for guidance on how they want to handle things. Um, you know, this is an area when, when you're issued a, a, a trash can or a recycling can, it stays with your house. You didn't buy it. It's waste management's property. It's assigned to your residence, your address. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I looked at it as an impact. To, you know, it fell into the category of impact fees because, like I said, more than fire, library, or school, there was a potential that you could impact those things. But these are ones nine times, ninety-nine percent of the time, people are going to want to utilize track services in the town rather than pay to have someone else take them away from them. But you're just giving giving your your receptacles to everybody in town. Correct. So why would you give them to new people that move into town the same way? Because we have to pay for those from waste management. So any you didn't have to pay for the other ones. They didn't come out of our tax dollars. It was rolled into the contract, which was part of our tax dollars that we're paying now. Yeah. But the, the contract itself that we signed for five years is based on a certain number of receptacles being paid. I get it. I get it. Yeah. And a new home hasn't paid that tax at those Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. And that's also my fear. If someone comes in, I don't know, a hundred unit apartment building or some other. Well, it's kind of an apartment building. We have to have dumpsters. Right. But if there was a large development put in that had 25 units in it, we're suddenly on the hook for a lot of money. I know that the realtors now, because of this whole thing that happened in Kingston, on their disclosure form, uh, we're changing the forms to add whether or not your trash receptacle is staying with the house. And adding that there may be a fee if it's not. Awesome. When you add the ADU, is that considered another $127 stock? So, up to this point, we've just been giving the people the receptacles as we've been distributing them. But you're saying if someone were to start, let's say we pass this today and someone were to come in tomorrow for an ADU, yeah. it would be $140 to get the barrels. Yeah. But then does trash people charge us another 127 for the stock? I mentioned it's 127 Yes. All right. So we, we basically track every single barrel that, we, that was distributed yeah. throughout town. We have a spreadsheet tracking all that. Anytime we add one, we have to send it to waste management and let them know that there's a new person on there. And they consider that a stop to tap yep. up and twenty seven bucks. Yep. And that's why, and that's why when we give us, us. Yes. And that's why when we give the second barrels, they have to pay for the second barrel. The six the you have to pay the full five years whether it right. yeah. or insurance. If you, if you want the second barrel, you're paying the six eighty seven. And the big pro rating on the worst this is real estate thing that happens, but be pro rating them on their closings. And they've got I mean, they have it down to the detail of how long it's taking them to stop because they're you know, fully automated trucks, there's cameras on everything, there's not much that they miss, so. Yeah. I see those more Yeah, so, but these people are moving into town, and for the $700, they are paying probably $7,000 in taxes. I mean, it's not, it's kind of spread out for everything. So it would be, the schedule we have now, the fee schedule for houses or ADUs, we'll just add on that $140. Yeah. Well, we already voted that we had to advise people Correct. that if they're building an ADU, don't forget that you have to pay for your new bill and it's going to come in. We just add that to the Yeah, we chose that and got it all of our paperwork. Great. So that's, that part's done. So just a matter of telling developers. So we've met the uh, unexpected yeah. expense. When did you guys pass that? Did we ask uh, a month ago? Oh. When did we update it? <laughs> uh, no, 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 and that was the main so what you're proposing is to have a problem called impact fee schedule because an ADU isn't separately listed out, so it's considered turning it into a multifamily. Yeah. Gotcha. But we did, it's, it's on our forms to remind people when they apply for an ADU that that would be a cost that they have to pay. So just a question, 
um, it's integrated with this, when you have a commercial property, <laughs> but you have a residence with it, would that be something you would allow now? Because I know it was allowed with the Resident and Storage, they had a residence mm -hmm. as part of the business. Mm -hmm. Well, we allow it. Okay. Depending on the zone. Yeah, my office has a residence over it. So that would be one of the exemptions that we that the board decided to grant is when if someone has a residence on a commercial property, then they would also be subject to that because they would have to get mm -hmm. so the business itself can't have trash pickup at the residence. Mm -hmm. So you start to think of all the different things there. So the difference at the present is because you brought that up is that that's a caretaker's mm -hmm. not necessarily a person's residence. Uh, it is where the person who's on man on being the manager is stays. So it's it's not a building residence or anything else in that sense. Uh, and presumably their trash they put it in the business. Correct. Time. We it's we gave them a water barrel to allow them to transition up up again because it was like you said, because it was part of the business, it was you know, security or whatever the rationale was. We went through the minutes and read it and then it stated it was part of the business, but mm -hmm. In another case, where it's someone whose home, whose primary residence is part of the commercial property, we have given barrels in those cases. It's mixed use, yeah. and a lot of towns in the area are now thinking about doing mixed use in the commercial areas to allow for housing, like on second level, and that sort of thing. So it's something we should think about if we ever decide to talk about that. So we. One take that as an action to add 132 impact fees for the traffic circles for, for the ADU? No, not ADU because any, uh, any impact fees are based on uh, on living uh, rooms. So, uh, and uh, I guess by the size of the chart. So that it, it, that would be applied across the board. Yeah. Any additional any additional housing units? Any additional housing units? Yeah. yeah. So that you just, it just increase the impact fee by one point. And uh, but we also talked about the impact fees were last discussed or last adopted in 2013. Yeah, and we talked about talking about the entire schedule as a whole and looking at that. So maybe if we could change like that, that, that would be a time to do it. It, it would be next time to do it. As you said, the fellow was out of business, so to speak. So he is out of business. I had made some inquiries, and it has not been a successful challenge so far. Right. I was afraid that this goes on for years. He might fill that out of pocket and put it in the house. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to talk to you. As long as we're comfortable with the fact that what we are assessing is it a finite number for actual capital item. I, I'm, I'm not worried that a judge is going to say you stray from the rationale of your impact awards. Because it's if we do something beyond that. Because if we do something beyond that, we have to amend our methodology that was prepared by Bruce Maker. Um, but if our starting point is the actual capital expenditure, I, I don't see that any judge is going to say anything about that. Because quite frankly, I think the town has the right to just assess that anyway. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I don't that, see that would be a decision by the board of selectmen. That would be what? That would be easier to pay for the two barrels to the associated bill. I think that's the answer. That's the answer. You put it in there and go out of there. You have to say quicker. Because God knows what it's going to take to get this. It doesn't mean that we can leave that piece get it. And you wouldn't want to add the $127 out-of-stop fee to the $140? No, because that's, that's an ongoing, just, that's not a capital expense. Okay. That's a, a use expense. So, yeah. Right. That's a, that's a system periodic staff of capital expense. And to Lynn's point, I mean, it would be, if they're paying taxes, then the pickup would be part of the tax. Part of the sort of, but yes. It's really that an additional, yeah. once it's first built, that's, right. that's not calculated in that budget year for, for that assessed fee. So are you going to 
I guess we'll propose that to the select board. Yeah. First time I've ever gone to the planning board first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Based on whether we build something in the future. Okay, so that well, makes sense. And, and that is not going to be a success for an actual physical product immediately. It would be worth it for any challenge. Right? Yeah. The, the easier way is just to end up in an assessment for you know, for work. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, you're marching with us. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Have a good evening. Have a good evening. Have a good evening. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes of the April 4th meeting? Uh, as the minutes of the April 4th meeting as good. With a second? Second. Any errors or omissions? Seeing none, I was a favor. Do you have a motion to approve the non public meeting minutes? I have a minute to read them because they were just talking about yeah. this evening because they're not public. Oh, can't we discuss them? We cannot discuss them. Discuss them so. <laughs> we, we can discuss an annual mission if she made it. No, no, no. no, no. I can't say that. It's different to begin. It's an odd enterprise. Approving the minutes of non public sessions is a bond enterprise. I mean, if somebody feels they need more time to review them and. No, I'm not saying I've got a lot of changes, but yeah, you can't even discuss amendment. Yes, we want it to be public. And then we'll have more non public. Yeah. Yeah, it's too short. No, 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 I'll make a motion to approve the non public meeting minutes from the April 4th. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Liz, I'm not going to vote on that one because I wasn't here for that. That's okay. Yeah, it's just that one abstention. Should we pass this back in? Yeah, 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 we need to pass it. That's all that's going on. Thank you. I don't know if it's going into my room at, at school one time. They use it for board meetings, school board meetings. They always come to those non club sessions. I got kids in here, they're not really that trustworthy in school suspension. We did receive correspondence um, from. Dennis Pintel, he has reviewed the separate plans for 266-125 and given him advice on how to, how to make a couple of changes. And he just sent us a letter to advise us on that. So, I didn't see any point in, in bringing that, you know, going through the whole thing because it was just a quick advisory that he saw it provide a couple more uh, events. I don't know. I think he said he was, he was involved in that design. I don't sure. know. But he had a couple more events and a couple of things here and there. Oh, I don't believe so. He said there was a meeting and he was involved in the design. Uh, maybe like the whole park or something like that. I don't think, yeah, just to review what he did initially uh, mm -hmm. for the information that they submitted in the actual site. But it was just second specific and it was just a couple of things he wanted them to, to revise, which they were doing and they're sending it forward to the town for approval and then to the state. So that was just a quick update on that. We did receive from the selectmen a few minutes ago a notion for intent to excavate. So we all know on Smallpox Road, um, Dan Parks has that area that we've been through. And Jason Parsons to that is owned by Central, Central View Power Land Company, LLC. And uh, they also want to do some excavation. The total committee was builders. It was It was Joey. It was Joey Wetson's. It was Joey Wetson's. It was Joey Wetson's. It was Wetson's. It was Joey 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 Wetson's. It was Joey
Yeah. But their sites are set. Well, I guess the other thing is that they, that they came to us with the whole plans and how much they were going to de-elevate that and the that, and they were talking about and excavating because that's why we had to do that whole bond sharing thing. Yeah. But, um, so, so we really, really got it. And, so, I mean, and I, 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 I know that I think it's, they're just, I, well, yeah, that from the level of knowledge I do have, I, I, it sounds like they're just carrying on from the original intent to excavate. But it's 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 since it's changed elements. Okay. Oh, okay. I can look at there. If they're staying within the agreed excavation for Wilson, then it really is just an information yeah. for us. So, so it has to be signed off by the time. So we have to sign off on it, so I think we just need somebody to verify that they're staying within. Okay. Is this something we should give to you or to Dennis? Um, I would prefer that Dennis has to be actually everything except the bond. You're going to have to sign in to the agreed yeah. bond for the road. So we'll send that off to Dennis and we I would imagine Wilson's going to step away from that. I would assume so. Father Wilson, I would. Yeah, I don't want to hear <laughs> So why don't we send that off to Dennis for his, okay. so we can check and make sure it's in line. And we're right, we need to talk about the bond. Yeah, and the bond has to So once Dennis has seen that, we should send that back to the selector with, with a note on the bond. Because they, they would do the bond. Such a what it was. They were, so so they were both excavating sites off of the same road. So since the bond was to protect any damage to the town's road, yeah. since they were both doing something, like they split the cost of the bond that the town evaluated what the bond should be since they were both trucking on material. Now it's there. Okay. Now it looks like somebody has purchased an iron. One of the properties, so the bond will either need to be absorbed or transferred or however they want to <laughs> But we just need to make sure that it's maintained. Right, because if Wilson just walks away and we only have half the bond, we think we get it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's trouble. <laughs> So is that something we need to ensure is happening? Or is yeah, that I'll call the ball and find out the Wigley is still under Wilson's name. And if it is, I'll contact Center and talk about it. Where's the Center? Center View. Center View. Center View, and I don't know. I, I don't it's know if it's associated with Lewis Builder somehow. Is the phone number over there? He was, he was giving some type of C services so and okay. parts, but that's okay. not. But then the phone number is So all of that's not a problem. And we'll let Dennis have a good time. Perfect. So, remind about the sidewalk. And then beyond that, um, folks who do, I'll be in that sidewalk. Sorry, 13, I'll be. I also will not be here. Huh? I also will not be here. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm proud of that. How dare you go away? I don't know. I, I gotta go in and just plant the table. So two won't be here, the rest of us all can. Okay. Running an emergency, so I'll be here. Then we'll have a quorum, right? Which is important. Okay. So we talked about going through the zoning articles and trying to see if. They needed any updates, any changes. So knowing that we were pretty busy with all the stuff that was done on our plates, I didn't want us to slip all over the wayside. So I took the email by my hands and I went through the historic district ordinance and looked first of all for things that might conflict with the Envision Kingston. And I didn't see any, but I did find some other things that we might want to think about that might have to do with logistics. Um, I didn't know if we wanted to delete the word mobile homes and add manufactured homes because there's many types of. Well, I, I, there's a difference. So, and there is a difference. And because manufactured just means it's, it's built off site, it can be built to the same specification as when I mean, we have a nice one right next to set up. So yep. that's a beautiful manufactured yep. home, but it, it was brought in by trucks and put together and built a real house. Yeah, so, it's a module. It, it's not wheels on the trailer anymore and it can be picked up in the trailer at night. Things like that too. There's, uh, I think we should, we should yeah. 
should not use the term manufactured harm interchangeably with mobile home because that, the intent is not to say that, that these nicely built um, houses that are put together from units that are built off site are any way inferior to um, a uh, uh, on site build. So that's really a good discussion because the actual definition of real estate is that you've got manufactured homes and then under that they come into two categories. One is mobile and one is modular. They both arrive at the property the same way. Most mobile homes, uh, many mobile homes now, no longer have wheels. In fact, most of them, some of them can sit on real foundations and you drive by and you can never even know that it was a mobile home. Yeah, because that would be why it's put together and say, yeah. sort of modular, but yeah. um, I think there's different, different building codes for them and things like that. And, and course, there are different codes. Yeah. And some of them have to be mobile homes, have to be highway, uh, have to be put on a highway, so. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm just looking because there's there. no, in the state, like, I only see reference to modular housing. Kingston has got a Because then we go into the definition of what constitutes a, a, a mobile home versus a travel trailer. Some of these travel trailers are enormous, but they're really dependent. <laughs> So they substituted manufactured housing for mobile home uh, in light of changes made in 1983. So this does not feel like it's a new thing. It's a new thing, and there was a lot of <laughs> change. So we're going back four days um, to when lots of towns put in ordinances against trailers or mobile homes. They were used interchangeably yeah. to uh, so keep people from right. putting a mobile home. Property and they weren't being taxed. That was the biggest issue as real estate. And so uh, they were recovering the number of the high and the number of the high and the stuff. Well, what we were describing, like with big 15 million mobile homes, those were something you could park in your backyard and wouldn't be it's taxed as a, a vehicle, not as a, uh, as a real estate. It's better what you call it. So, and I believe, like, I mean, gathered that in 1983, there were some changes to what towns could and couldn't do as far as regulating. The changes made in 1983, for the first time, uh, what we would consider a mobile home, what used to be called a trailer, trailer yeah. were actually now regulated as to their construction. And so, for example, building codes, building codes yeah. they had to meet certain codes. And um, lenders, many, many lenders would not lend on anything older than that because they weren't up to the code that came forward at that time. It also does differentiate them by virtue of modular versus mobile, an RV, as opposed to what would have been a trailer. Normally, a mobile will have a serial number. Mm -hmm. That was always the big thing. It's like, oh, serial number. Yeah. Oh, because it was a trailer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah so, that, in fact, they still do get serial numbers, I think. Yeah. They all have serial numbers. And yeah, when they're purchased, you're purchasing that serial number. I don't know, 20 years ago, some of them were so nice, I couldn't even afford to get the trailer park and boards with them. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of times, I have to get the What is our definition of the home? Well, we had four in Kingston, and we had to go Kingston had like three definitions for the same thing, but they call them three different things. And it depends what you're talking about. And they also have the definition for travel trail. Travel trail, that was travel trail is another one. Yeah. Building yeah. is another one. Yeah. Manufacturing is another one. Yeah. Yeah. And what they have to do is specifically they talk about a travel trail trailer from the flood zone in Kingston. Specifically. No other word, no signs, and violent talk about it except for the flood zone. Travel trailer. 
So here we've got mobile home or house trailer, a prefabricated structure or dwelling unit which is designed for long term and continuous residential occupancy, which is designed to be moved on wheels as a whole in sections which may be temporarily or permanently affixed to real estate. Okay, and that would differentiate between travel trailer and mobile home and house trailer. Is used to, uh, so, so that's pretty good if we use that as being the same thing. Do we have another definition anywhere? Uh, well, that's number Trouble. 18 and the travel tool is 14. 24. 24, yeah. yeah. No, I, th I think we're okay in that. Now that's interesting, Chris. Did you read the definition of travel trailer? 32 feet maximum. 32 feet by 8 feet max. The, the eight feet is obviously overloaded about um, being having to be an extra wide load. Not really, 102 inches is oh, the maximum. Okay. Uh, yeah, so so does it just instantly, if it's because I mean, there are lots of fifth wheel campers and stuff like that that are way beyond that length limitation. Do they immediately not fall into that definition at that point? That's my mouth. <laughs> That's right. Over in, um, at Danville, at the Rock River Park, Park, there are many of the homes, <laughs> and they're 12 feet by 34 feet. Yeah. And this is 32. So, it, just interesting. I mean, they're, they're considered trail. I mean, they're considered house trails that they get around for full time. Yeah, but they can't be transported down the road. Then I'm like, they're 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 Separate from the fact that we mentioned it with the historic district. Right. Um, just bring our ordinances up to date with whatever the current standard is. And I'm willing to give that a shot for our next board session. That sounds good. Let's see what the better definition is of both of those things. Can I just ask though, so this is getting confusing for me. So the definition of a mobile home or house trailer, the last sentence is which may be temporarily or permanently affixed to real estate, but we're not talking about temporarily. No, we're talking about permanently. So we need to have a separate definition for that, correct? Well, I think if it's temporarily affixed, or are we just saying we're not? I think we should take out temporarily, because it's permanently affixed. I mean, it used to be, I can remember something that brought their mobile, they were in the service, and at the station in Texas, and he was he was retiring from the service, and they had him over home. They had gone from base to base to base to base, and I mean it was a real, you know, 960 square foot motor home. I mean motor home, and they took it from base to base, and she bought the lot uh, on um, the Boston Road, bought the lot, and they parked it there. When they built the house around it, it was twice the size, but. They lived in that way for a long time, and it was just something that they did. They did take them from place to place. I haven't heard that happening since then, but that happened back in 1970 something. Oh, so before 83? That's not that we It's true. Oh, I thought it was easy. I need to find a way to manage with more ball. I don't know. It was a day was a was a more Yeah. Well they put it on the back. I mean they had wheels and everything else and they didn't do I mean obviously it was the the drive. Right. Yeah. But if we don't want to get a job when these things and I used to ride out the bike to put still on it and we didn't tell it. So it's interesting because again, the members are right out on the choir and the wheels we go on for the mental child. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, the wheels have to be gone before it can be considered that. It really, it really is a permanent structure. So I guess we need to. So that's a good thing to put up in our next meeting. Yeah, I'll, I'll come up and leave with what the current standard seems to be. Yeah.
Yeah, I would suggest that anything to do with uh, historic history um, that this would be done in conjunction with Absolutely. The city. So my thought is if we did this now, then we could meet with them maybe at the June meeting or June meeting. Because yeah, they're, doing, they're doing a lot of really nice of those ADU prefabs. Seven men, I mean, they come in in a day and it's up. Yeah. And they're nice. A lot of them are going to those are the general rules. You have a giant considered one of the homes. So, um, yeah. so, I was concerned that as we went through this book, people might look at the historic district out of the window too and think that that was everything. And it's not because we have regulations. They go with it, which is why I thought we should add a new section just telling people that there's another place to go looking for information. I'm going to start with it. Yeah. So we have, there's a whole section. You have your historic district ordinance, mm -hmm. and then in, um, I think it's 12, in 1200, is your historic district rules and regulations? A lot of that is more administrative, mm -hmm. but it's definitely in a different, way different section as well. Yeah. It would definitely be good because the lay person is going to, the lay person that maybe doesn't want to come and ask questions, they're going to say, well, if the town has their crap together, I should be able to look it up online. And if they only look at one section that doesn't reference anything else they need to be aware of, they're going to read that one part and say, okay, I'm going to go. And then they get in the middle of it and somebody comes in and says, well, no, you're not. Well, how was I supposed to know that? I looked in the town's section and talked about this. And so I just thought it was important that we put the new section in here that just told people that there was another place to go look in as well. And because then we changed our numbers. And when it came to design considerations, um, 102.7, what was interesting was that 102. Point, with my um, tell them that um, they need to go into the rules and regulations to see what the design considerations are as well. Again, they're just sending them back to that area. Um, when it came to the sign regulations, all the sign regulations are here, but these sign regulations don't have any of the definitions of signs that are in our sign ordinance. So I thought we should probably take the historic district sign regulations and put it in the, the sign ordinance and tell them to go looking at the sign ordinance yeah, because this is severely lacking the definitions that we worked so hard on a few years ago about what size signs, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, it does say it has to comply with the towns. Mm -hmm. And then they have additional requirements. Um, but again, put everything in one place, is yeah. I thought. Yeah. So that people... So that there should be a reference in here to refer to the historic district sign rooms. Some of them should include a reference that says yeah. that go to the sign rooms. And what right. does? And then they would find a particular section in the sign rooms yeah. that's actually historic district signs. Yeah. Yeah, all it says is all signs must meet requirements for size and location as stated in the zoning board, zoning and building codes of the town of Kingston. And then it's got additional. Uh, rules. But if they were all in one place, if people just went to the sign, and that's going to come back here. No, that's, that's, just, that's good because as we discovered, you know, if the person who's not hiring an attorney, the land use attorney to, to do this for them, has to come in and talk to Rob and, and, uh, and uh, the co enforcement officer and try to make sense of that. and. Um, uh, feel like they're getting shuffled around for a bit. Well, so I just thought it was easier to consolidate things. And then under the rules and regulations, which was 1200. Yeah. Hold on. Going back. Yeah. So looking at the 1200, the rules and regs, I was looking at, um, 1201.4. Actually, after all this, I didn't think there were very many changes, were there? Really. 
So it said the historic district here in Park Commission will accept applications for certificates of approval to alter, improve, restore, construct, change the use of, and from our legal, the legal uh, ruling we got from our, it wasn't change the use of, it was the impact of changing the use. So I thought maybe we should add that there so that would be clear. And so how would that read approval to alter, improve, restore, construct? It said it says change the use of yeah. the impact of changing the use of. Okay. I'll just well, approval to impact the change. Mm -hmm. Approval to alter, improve, restore, construct, change the use of, demolish, and move structures. Yeah, we need to figure out the wording, but I think we still need to, if they're not supposed to change the use, it's the impact of changing the use. From what the, is, is that correct then? From what the attorney said? supposed to interpret the use. That's not the HTC's responsibility. So instead of change of use, impact of use? It could just say, yeah, impact of use. Impact of use, yeah. Just impact of use. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, when we were having our last meeting and we were looking at um, talking about the use of 186 Main Street. <laughs> One of the people came up to me afterwards, one of the people sitting in the audience, and they said that there should be something in our ordinances that say that the HDC will allow changes to, the, to a building required by the building fire codes. So, for example, if you've got a building that needs um, it's a business in town and it needs a ramp, a handicap ramp. You know, they should be able to change that. You know, anything that would be like the, the code, the fire safety. I mean, that would be true, presumably, for like external fire escapes and things like that. Mm -hmm. okay. yep. Yes. No. Yep. Um, one of the things that we've discovered with, when we did looking at changing the Nichols building was that uh, there are exemptions for historic districts mm -hmm. and historic buildings from certain codes so that they are not required to be ADA accessible if it would alter a historic building or a building in a historic district. Wait. <laughs> and so so that now you can and you can still look at a variance huh. to do that. And specifically, that's one of the variances that doesn't convey the property is that uh, a variance for a person with, uh, with a disability, for example, a combination slot, uh, that will go with, with the owner and it expires when the uh, person who needs that um, uh, alteration or that variance is no longer there. That's the only example of, of, of a variance that doesn't. Is indeed it doesn't convert the property. So. so this person's thought was if you needed something that was required by fire building code in order to get an occupancy permit, mm -hmm. that they shouldn't necessarily be allowed to deny that. They thought that should, they thought that should be in all the zones, but um, they were specifically talking about historic districts. So I wanted to raise that because that number the public did raise it. But for the person who should know that there's exemptions to those codes on the start properties. So can't deny a building occupancy or an occupancy permit based on the exemption. I mean, not based on a code that, that is... But authority to deny has definitely come into question this past year. Mm -hmm. Is that a third? But the authority to deny has definitely come into question this year, but like for that current project. Like that's why we went to legal, because if people had different interpretations. Mm -hmm. But not, not on that particular code. No, but so that's what I'm saying. That's what this something I suggest is 
is to put in, put in a requirement that um, that says that you can make the changes that you may not have to in order to to get the occupancy permit, which theoretically shouldn't be denied because you didn't have to make those changes. So I mean, it's 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 it's, it's right about thing. Every every body should do it. Every case should be looked at. So we applies for occupancy permit and say no because it doesn't meet this fire safety code. And the person says, well, when they go back to the HTC, so we want to do this, and they can say, well, here's the here's the uh, statute that exempts you from from that. Yeah, I guess I guess my issue with that would just be there's a difference between somebody not wanting to bring it to code to preserve the historic right. atmosphere of their own building or they want to make it meet current codes and being prevented by another entity of doing that because they want to impose their, their feelings on the aesthetics of the building. I think if I think if the individual wanted to meet those codes they should be I, I personally don't think that HDC should be able to prohibit them from meeting current codes due to their wishes for the aesthetics. I think absolutely you should allow it for people that say, hey, you don't have to update to this code and this exemption is allowed through the Historic District Commission if you choose to get the exemption, but I don't think the exception should be forced upon you by the entity. Particularly, I would think if you're entering into either a lease or some sort of rental agreement with somebody, and the liability then sits if you're yeah. putting people in that. Life safety. Yeah. I, but I, I think there's a need for both those situations. I think yeah. I think if the individual homeowner wants to use that exception, they should be authorized to do it. But I don't think that exception can be forced on them if they want to meet a current life safety code that exists in other I mean, places. yeah, there's, there's, there's codes that are left wiring things like that, and, you know, certain things like that. In fact, that there could be other codes, such as materials used, uh, uh, commercial building, or whatever that, you know, they could, could change and, and could significantly alter a building so that it's no longer appropriate to the, uh, the district. So I'd be careful before you should make changes to the historic district that weren't the intention of others when they established it. That allow people to modify a promise. Now, for example, the same thing the same. external fire escapes obviously went on at some point quite a long time ago because that's a school and kids have to have a, another way out except a single stairway in there. Um, but, you know, at what point do you say, well, it's going to start building and, you know, once, once it's owned by a private individual, I'm saying, uh, should these external fire escapes be on there? Or should, is there another way of doing it that doesn't detract from them? No, that's probably grandfather, but uh, to detract from the uh, the of the building. I know the Robinson Phoenix on here never had this fire external fire escapes on it. What's that? The Robinson Phoenix on here, similar building, next time over. Mm -hmm. uh, it burnt down in the 60s, early 60s. Um, I think it's at 61. Um, but uh, it was been being used as, as an auxiliary schoolhouse, and uh, it never had external fire escapes on it. So. Uh, and probably we never would have gone, but but that's just that's just an example. I mean, at least all the people who burned inside it looked pretty incorrect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so I would suggest that yeah, we need to do changes, but uh, I would be careful about following the HDC, but. Oh, no, I did. This is just a discussion with HDC, but I wanted to make sure we had our sort of ducks in a row before we decided to meet with them to see what we were thinking. How does that work with insurance? So if you're in a historic district and let's say current building codes require two means of egress, 
And you've only got one because one of them is external. If you buy a house and you have to build the new building goods, you have to figure out how to do that. And if it's going to go off the other than the other side of the house, you know, there's there's a way we're going to build it. We're going to build it. We're going to build an extension. It's approved by the HTC that we can build out of the back. A step back sort of system there as a second equals. That's the type of thing we sort of work with the HDC on figuring out what would be the minimum impact, impact. And because it was behind, you know, putting a, a shoe out the front, not into the front yard, uh, would not have been you know, a good solution to that. But they, they came up with something that worked to be to do building codes or existing building codes. Any further thoughts? What do you think about getting together with the HGC next month? What time is it? It's on our schedule for June. The first meeting of June. In yeah. June. Nothing. Nothing. Anything. Yeah. Perfect time to do it. That was the thought. Great thought. Okay. Perfect. We'll invite them to attend. Can we just have a general discussion and go ahead and have this research done on the housing? Um, yes, yeah, so, so we'll send this along to the HTC this week for mm -hmm. them to see. Yeah. Just for conversation. Oh, for for conversation. Yeah. yeah, first we can do this with that business meeting, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that'd be a perfect time. Yeah, that's a try and then try to knock through these. You know, maybe next one we'll put in on the residential zones and kind of go through those that they're still ready in the summer. Anything else we need to talk about? Uh, as far as the business, mm -hmm. uh, we do have um, one thing. Yeah, we have the application for some of the mm -hmm. And the board should be considering whether or not they want to declare that a product of regional impact. The statute requires that we make a decision. It doesn't require us to have to, and it does require us to. Uh, Evaluated on a series of criteria, um, but it should be done now before the hearing because we're technically not supposed to even go to a hearing until that decision has been made. Because we declared it on 266, correct? Yes, we did. We did. Well, they they, 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 they even said that, that we know this is going to be the yeah. end. And this is basically they took out the gas station there and from here. And I think that the issues are traffic. And I would say that it's also um, because it's so close to the run of town line, as it was the 266, you know, we really expect that the run was going to do something big, you know, just south of South Road, you know, right? Right there at that, that corner next to us, we would expect to of, uh, of a project like that. Um, we make a determination on the. Uh, and which will impact we determine which communities need to be notified? Yeah, and, and I think the obvious thing has to be notified, and the. Um, and the, the whatever, I mean, whatever communities would be affected by it, and I think that would be the affected communities in this case. Do we know which, which number that is in here? I'm sorry? Do we know where that is in the show? It's not in our law, it's in state law. Oh, it's in state law? I was just thinking about the criteria was that we needed to decide by the six fifty two maybe or fifty four. Um I've got it here uh, it's on page twenty one. Twenty one on page twenty one. The well institution in fact should be made in accordance with all states 36, 54 through 36, 58. So we have 54 to be So the plan is for the time RSA 6727, which includes planning questions. Upon receipt of an application for development, shall review it properly and determine whether or not the development, if approved, reasonably could construe could be construed as having the potential for regional impact. Doubt concerning regional impact shall be resolved in the determination of development has a potential regional impact. 
Development of regional impact means any proposal before a land, local land use board, which in the determination of such local land use board, could reasonably be expected to impact on a neighboring municipality because of factors such as, but not limited to the following. One, relative size and number of dwelling units as compared to existing stock. And this would not apply since it's not any dwelling units. Proximity to the borders of the neighboring community. And that would be uh, certainly a case where that would apply transportation networks. And that is the big one because we are Gas stations typically are directed to traffic for people that are already on the road. Right. So, one of the ways that it's constantly intended to the yeah. town and it's over and off. So, those are both issues. Um, yeah, so the traffic anticipation, anticipated emissions such as light, noise, smoke, odors, or particles. And proximity to aquifers, there you go, or surface waters which transcend municipal boundaries and shared facilities such as schools and solid waste disposal facilities up in time be a criteria but proximity to aquifers as you pointed out in the uh, waters which transcend um, municipal boundaries of course the river because those are the and these are the ones because it's a state permit for the transportation yeah. so they're going to the state's going to look at this and grant their permit um, however they decide on those other two issues, I think, are important. Yeah. And when you think about it, the river flows right into it. Yeah, oh yeah. It all goes into it. It all goes into it. And it does go around a lot. So it does go around. And the subdivision river goes to the river, and then it goes to the river, and 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 it goes to the river. But it's a very good thing that you can write that down on the law of the judgment. So we, we know that it's there. We know that the author is there. And we know the author is confined to the town of Kansas. Yeah. So it should be kind of taken over. And that we're going to think that's the best way to take it over. To, take it over. to say that there's a the belief in it could have it. You know, it must be a reason that we have it. And that the town. That would be uh, notified would be the town of And there are any conditions. They have. Yeah, it's a ton of information that it gives you. In that statute, when Glenn does it well, it gives you who we have to notify through Sam and 36, semicolon 54. So we would notify that one and, and just about that. And they know that one from the RPC. Yeah, yeah, they know that one. And all this does is relate those two entities of the larger yes. sense. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's all it does. What does the upper floor? Aquifer going to be aware just no. by just by way. Oh, does it go into East Kingston? Mm. No. No. I don't believe it does. I can, no. I can check that. I don't believe that it does. I don't think so. You know, it's one of those things that much RDC gets in the procedure. I don't think they do. They have to go to the various Kingston commissioners to participate in their way. Here, I can certified mail. Okay. So, we obviously have a hearing on it? They will have a meeting. They will have a meeting on the project. But they will have a meeting on their uh, project's original impact. So, we're looking for a motion? So, when's our, yeah, when's our next meeting on this? When's our? It, it, it's it's all scheduled here for these schedule for April 5th, May 8th. Two weeks from now. It is two weeks from now. So, by, because by our. And so by RSA, at least 14 days prior to the public hearing, the local land use board shall notify by certified mail all affected municipalities and the regional planning commission of the date, time, and place of hearing and their right to testify concerning the development. Well, is there how long will we receive this initial application of land? How long will the planning board is not the original that came to this town. That no, the planning board. When they came, we remember we had a little diagram of where we showed us all what they wanted to do and everything. Oh, that's not the idea. That wasn't something. That was the, uh, the, the when we decided to do a preliminary bid, produce plan. It wasn't an application. It was just a 